So in this video, I wanna talk about the different theoretical approaches to family and, and social issues and social problems in families. Um, in the first part of the class, I introduced you to the basic theories, functionalism, conflict, symbolic interaction, feminism, and exchange theory. So in the second half of the class, my hope is that you all will be able to take a social institution or a social problem and apply those theories to that particular institution. So in this case, we're talking about family. Families are people who are related by blood, marriage, adoption, or kinship. Again, kinship is the strong connection that you have to people. Um, you probably understand what I mean by blood, marriage, or adoption, but you may have people who you consider family who aren't technically related to you by blood, marriage, and adoption, but you think of them, them as like a cousin or a grandma or an aunt or an uncle. We're, we're including those people in our definition of family as well when we say kinship. And families are different from households. Households are people who share a residence or share a dwelling versus being related by blood, marriage, adoption, or kinship. So let's look at family from a functionalist viewpoint. How would a functionalist view family? Functionalists are going to argue that family is needed to keep society stable and orderly and harmonious. We need a system of family, a set of rules and norms and values and expectations about things like how we're going to raise children, how we're going to take care of children and elderly, how we're going to pair up or partner up or create a reproductive and a sexual sort of connection with people to keep our society going. How do we reproduce our values and norms? Um, they would say that each member of the family should perform their own um, expressive and instrumental roles are the terms that they use so that people in families need to have someone being an expressive nurturing person and an instrumental breadwinner protector person. Um, they believe strongly in traditional family roles. They would also say that we need family as a way to regulate sexual behavior. We can't have everybody running around willy-nilly doing everybody left and right. So we need a set of norms and rules that say, you know, this is who you're allowed to have sexual relationships with. We also use it as a way to pattern reproduction. And, and that means two things, reproduction as in having children, but also how we reproduce the culture. For a functionalist, families needed to reproduce the cultural values, the language, the norms, the manners, the expectations that we have of people. Many of those things are learned in the context of family. The next thing, organizing production and consumption. In the traditional capitalist view, um, in the early days before capitalism was as prominent, families were often a source of production. They, made, they built their own homes, they made their own clothes, they produced their own foods. In the current era that we're in, which I would argue is probably late stage capitalism, families are a primary source of consumption. When you buy homes, when you buy cars, when you look at advertising for things like Jif peanut butter, you know, choosy moms, choose Jif. They are appealing to your sense of family. So family is really a site from a capitalist viewpoint, a major site of consumption. You buy a home, you buy a car, you buy a refrigerator, you buy your wireless phone plan. All of those things are bought with family in mind, not just individuals. And functionalists think that's a, a positive thing about um, family. Families also are supposed to socialize children and provide care and protection for people who are sick, people who are elderly, people who are vulnerable because they have a disability or something like that. Um, provide care for children. Families are needed, and if families don't do that, then the society can't remain stable and harmonious and orderly, which remember, that's what functionalists want, right? Stability, harmony, and order. We're all interrelated, we're all interdependent, we're connected to each other. And the last thing that family does from a functionalist viewpoint is it provides us with the social status. We're born into a particular position in the hierarchy and, and family is often sort of the source of our status. And that leads to conflict theory because conflict theorists are probably not going to be too thrilled about the fact that a lot of your social status is determined by the family that you're born in and not necessarily your actions or, or your position um, that you've maybe earned. Um, so let's talk about the conflict view of family. So conflict theorists, remember, they're going to say society is, is driven by this constant competition and conflict over scarce resources. 
And they would argue that that creates a lot of inequality. And because there's so much inequality, it creates problems with things like alienation. And they would argue that it needs to be changed or challenged, that that inequality, that that competition and conflict leaves some people being exploited. It leaves some people having a lot more power and influence. So what would they say? They would say, well, within family, people often don't have equal status. Some people have more power than others. A lot of them might talk about gender, how gender influences power in families. Why is it that men, for example, tend to have more power than women? Um, why do wealthy families have more power than poor families? Think about the situation with the coronavirus when we talk about families being able to isolate someone. Um, if, if one family member gets sick with the virus, you know, if you are a wealthy family, you can send that person to your basement and they can quarantine in the basement or quarantine in their room. But for poorer families who are sharing, you know, a household with parents, grandparents, children, and maybe they only have two or three bedrooms, they're not gonna be able to do that kind of thing. They don't have the same um, kind of power and, and space and money to buy a bigger house to be able to do that kind of thing. Um, family's often a source of violence. That's one thing that conflict theorists would say as well, that families create a lot of conflict with each other, that domestic abuse is a problem, and they would be very concerned about, even though families are supposed to care and protect, um, care for and protect each other, how often are children abused by parents? When, when a child dies, we often look at the parents, in particular the mother first. When a woman dies, her spouse is, or ex-spouse or boyfriend or current boyfriend is the one most likely to have killed her. So it's very, very important for us to think about that critically. And conflict theorists are going to say, you know, as much as family should be the source of stability, it often isn't. Um, they would also say that capitalism really undermines family, that rather than emphasizing our ties and our connection, many families are caught up in this rat race of keeping up with the Joneses and trying to do more than their neighbor. And maybe they're, they have a bigger house and a more better paying job, but are they, are they able to spend time with their kids? Are they able to spend time at their home? Are they able to nurture those bonds? Has capitalism undermined our sense of family and our connection to each other? Um, they would talk about unrealistic and unhealthy role expectations in families and how that creates tension and conflict between children and parents and spouses. They would talk about how the government could play a role in allevi alleviating inequality, things like getting paid family leave. Maybe that would, when we talk about change in families, that might help with some gender inequality, that might help with some class-based inequalities. What kind of social welfare programs can we create to keep families from falling behind? Um, and they would also talk a lot about the problems of balancing family and work and how capitalism kind of drives us in the direction of prioritizing work over family. Symbolic interactionists, remember, they're gonna say that society is socially constructed and defined through our perceptions, our values, our relationships, our interactions. And for symbolic interactionists, language is really the key element of any culture. And one of the things that symbolic interactionists are gonna focus on a lot is how the definition of family is changing rapidly right? The definition of family is no longer the same as what it was in the 1950s. We are no longer a family with a breadwinner father and four or five kids and a stay-at-home mom who cooks. Maybe we never were that way in some, some ways, but that was the stereotype of the 1950s family. Families have changed dramatically. The definition has shifted. Um, we have more dual breadwinner couples than ever that has redefined how we negotiate and interact and relate to each other in families. We now allow people of the same sex to get married. You see more and more people talking about open relationships or polyamory or new ways of thinking about our familial relationships with each other. We are redefining family. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing, a symbolic interaction is is not really interested in that. They would just point out that that's already happening. And they would go at the, at the functionalist theorists and say, you know, you may think that these roles are the best roles, but it is inevitable that these, these roles are going to be defined and redefined differently at different times, in different places, in different cultures, particularly things like gender, gender roles. 
They would talk about the social scripts and expectations of families. They would talk a lot about how families communicate and how role expectations affect our communications and our interactions with each other and the way our language shapes how we see family and how we relate to our family members. The last one would be feminist. Feminists are gonna emphasize gender, right? They're gonna say that patriarchy has guided familial relationships in our culture. We live in a culture where men tend to have more power than women, and they would argue that that needs to be changed. Sounds a little bit like conflict theory there, doesn't it? Feminism and conflict have a bit of overlap. Um, also, there's a little bit of overlap with sim uh, symbolic interactionism as well. They might talk about the sexual double standard in families. They might talk about whether or not marriage promotes patriarchy and gender inequality. They would, they would argue that we need to create marriages that are more egalitarian, where men and women are sharing equally in the power, and they, they want us to envision that happening, and feminists would call for more egalitarianism. Um, gendered violence and control should be eliminated, in their view, from our family relationships. I'm not going to get into exchange theory because that's not as prominent in the field, but I do want you to understand these four major theoretical perspectives. Again, functionalism, conflict, symbolic interactionism, and feminism. Those are four theoretical views, and in this case, I'm applying it to family.